we've just been kind of spoiled here lately, I suppose, but it surely is good to see everyone. Glad that you can be with us. <clears throat> of course, this past Thursday was Valentine's Day, and so you said, probably should have preached this last week, maybe so, but uh, nothing like love. I mean, it's kind of like what makes the world go around, right? And we think about love, and there's uh, probably the, the thing that jumps out to us about love would be maybe a, a young couple who perhaps are just getting to, you know, date and know each other and the great, you know, kind of puppy love thing that goes on. But I guess as we get older and realize uh, there's a lot more to love. Nowadays, I, I think uh, personifications of love are couples that, you know, celebrate that 50th anniversary, 50th wedding anniversary. And you know, there's love. <laughs> now, you might see two kids out somewhere uh, holding hands and looking at each other like, you know, they've... Uh, melted, but uh, real love, uh, we know, takes a lot more than just having warm, fuzzy feelings about somebody. Real love is willing to give up self. You don't see a couple that's been married 50 years or 25 years even that uh, hasn't learned uh, how to give and to take, how to, uh, you know, you have to appreciate what other people want, and sometimes you have to be willing to give up what you want in order to uh, make that relationship work. And I believe that's the, the very essence of love. This morning, we're going to talk about a passage that's very familiar to each and every one of us. In John 14, at verse 15, if, if you remember the context of this, we, we know the verse that says, if you love me, keep my commandments. Well, the context is, this is Jesus' last week on earth. Uh, chapter 14, 15, 16, 17, they're like the, him talking to his disciples, knows that he's fi- know, he knows that he's fixing to die begins that uh, wonderful passage in chapter 14, verse 1, the beginning of the context of this passage, and says, you know, you believe in God, believe also in me, in my Father's house and many mansions. You know, I go away. Thomas says, we don't know where you're going. Jesus says, I'm the way, the truth, the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. Philip says, well, you just show us the Father, and that'll suffice us. And Jesus says, Philip, I've been so long with you that you haven't figured out if you've seen me, you know, you've seen the Father. And then he talks about, I am the Father in one, and so forth. And then, in this verse, if you love me, keep my commandments. Now, this is the King James Version, and I really appreciate uh, some of the newer translations here, the American Standard Version of 1901, even the NIV. The New King James, I believe, has this as well. But the aorist uh, imperative is brought out here. It's just a tense in language, and and they, and they, they translate it, you will, it's imperative, you will keep my commandments. That ties in so well with a verse we're probably all familiar with in 1 John chapter 2, verse 3. And hereby we do know that we know him. How do you do that, John? If we keep his commandments. Verse 4, he says, He that saith, I know him, keepeth not his commandments, is a liar. The truth's not in him. You see, if you love Jesus, if you love him, if you love God, you're going to do what he has to say. And that's just foreign for some folks today. That Christ loves us, we know. Nobody does or did, will do what Jesus did that doesn't have love. Jesus even said that true love is a man that laid down his life for his friend. Jesus laid down his life for us in that while we were yet sinners, the Roman letter says, Christ died for us. A sorry individual person I used to be, Jesus died for me. No matter where I find myself, what state in life I find myself, Jesus died for me. I need to make that personal because it is. I remember as a child seeing pictures, you know, a man's eyes of what they thought the crucifixion would have looked like and seeing the agony. You know it would have been agonizing. Just the idea of someone running nails through your wrists, your hands, to hold you up on a cross. And to just let you sit there and, and smother to death. I didn't even figure that out till later. I just thought he bled to death. You don't do that. You smother. That's what crucifixion's all about. It's an open, public, humiliation, humiliating way to die. It's how they killed the worst of criminals. As a matter of fact, the Romans outlawed killing a Roman by crucifixion. They just said it's too uh, barbaric. It's too inhumane. And that coming from Romans. Imagine that. So you know it had to be pretty bad. In Hebrews 2 at verse 9, the Bible says, But we see Jesus who was made a little lower than the angels for the suffering of death, crowned with glory and honor, that he by the grace of God should taste death for every man. Of course, the word man there is anthropos, men and women. Jesus died for every one of us. So we know that he loved us. 
Jesus invites all to come. One of the most beautiful passages I believe in scriptures, Matthew 11, verses 28 through 30. Come unto me, all ye that are labor and heavy laden. Do you labor? Are you heavy laden? Do you think sometimes the weight of the world's resting upon your shoulders? Jesus says, you come to me. You come to me and I'll take care of that. As we'll see tonight, in first, try to be back tonight. We're going to be looking at 1 Peter chapter 5, verses 5 through the end of that book, verse 14. And uh, cast all his cares upon you. You know, I mean, cast all your cares upon him, for he careth for you. That's the idea. Jesus says, you give it to me. I will give you rest. I can handle it. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly in heart, and you shall find rest unto your souls, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Jesus says, you give it to me. I'll take it. My yoke is easy. Love defined. You know, if you were to walk out of this building and ask somebody, well, what do you think love means? I think we probably wouldn't find ten people with the, with the same answer. I know there was a time in my life when I thought love was when my mom bought me a Hot Wheel, you know, when we'd go to Woolworths uh, once a week. I thought, that's love, now somebody would buy you a Hot Wheel. But that's not love at all. In the Bible, love is defined as, for instance, 1 John 5, 3, for this is the love of God that we keep his commandments. His laws, his statutes, the Greek word is antile, it means somebody tells you to do something, you do it. We keep his commandments, and his commandments, they're not grievous, they're not burdensome, they're not something that's designed to make us miserable. His commandments are really there to help us out, to make us better, to give us the best possible life that we can have, is if we live in a community that's keeping the commandments of God, if we live in a nation that is keeping the commandments of God, and that's one of the reasons, brethren, it's high time that we really made our voices be known. Our country is not living like God would have it to be. And hence, we're going to suffer that. You know, God raises up kingdoms and he puts down kingdoms. You have problems believing that, ask Babylon. Ask Syria. Assyria. Ask Rome. Ask these mighty nations that now lie in rubble. But this is the love of God that we keep his commandments and his commandments are not grievous. They're for our best interest. Notice 2 John 1, 6. And this is love that we walk after his commandments. This is the commandment that ye have heard from the beginning. Ye should walk in it. <clears throat> John 14, 21, just a few verses from where we were reading earlier. He that hath my commandments and keepeth them, he it is that loveth me. You want to tell if a fellow loves God? How does he live his life? Is he walking after the commandments of God? Is he doing what God would have him to do? If he does, then he loves God. He that loveth me shall be loved of my Father, and I will love him, and I will manifest myself to him. You see how that reciprocates? Jesus says, you love me, God will love you, and I'll be there with you. Verse 23, Jesus answered and said unto him, If a man love me, he will keep my words, and my Father will love him, and I will come unto him and make our abode with him. But we've got a huge problem today, folks. We've got a huge problem, brethren. And I just want to share uh, one phrase with you. If you don't take anything home with you today besides uh, something, if you take anything, take this, okay? In the book of Revelation, it's no less than five times, chapter 4, 11, 15, 16, and 21, we find a phrase used about God. Notice the second part there saying, Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty. Now, most people that, that have any idea of God or believe in any type of God, you know, you say God, and they're like, hey, I don't have a problem with that. I believe in God. Uh, even some people who, you know, uh, don't, <laughs> they, everybody has a God. They have some idea, it appears, except those who would just flat out tell you, listen, I'm atheist. I don't believe in any kind of God. But God is always that kind of person or thing that is sort of uh, subservient to their needs, their desires. You know, they kind of get in trouble. Well, now's a good time to appeal to God. You know, I'm going to run to God now. So they have this idea of God. And they'll even, they'll go with that. You know, you got your God, I got my God, we'll have our gods, there's God. And then there's those that they'll even go with Almighty. Oh, yeah, all-powerful? Yep, I believe that. God can do anything. Man, he created this. We, you know, he can do whatever he wants. And they don't have a problem with that. So they're with you on God, and they're with you on Almighty but when it comes to, to the Lord, when it comes to lordship, you see, a lord in the first century was somebody, uh, basically the word was a slaveholder. And he owned the people, if you will. And whatever the Lord said went. And if the Lord said, do this, you did that. You didn't argue about it. 
You didn't say, well, I think it'd be better if we did this. You just did what the Lord said. I remember working with a fellow one time, and we worked for another man. And this man wanted this job done a particular way. Well, this good friend of mine, I love him to death. We were all brethren, but we were working together. He wanted to do it another way. And I would just say, listen, the man's paying our salary. This is his material. Let's just do it the way he wants. And no, he'd want to sit around and argue about that. Well, we'd, it'd be better if we did it this way. Well, he didn't understand the idea of a boss or lordship. You know, when God says, do this, and here's how you do it, brethren, that's how you do it. Friends, that's what, God, that's what Lord means. Kyrios is the Greek word. It means Lord. It means master. And you don't go up to the master and say, look, I know you want it done this way, but I'd really like to do it that way. You don't do that. And so when it comes to the idea of lordship, that's where people, in our, particularly in our country, where we want to do everything the way we want to do it, we run into, into some real problems, particularly when it comes to obeying the gospel, how we worship God, how we approach God. People say, I'm going to do it the way I want to do it, because I think, I think God would kind of like my idea. They totally don't get lordship. They don't understand the master-servant relationship, and that's what we are. Jesus would tell us many times. The servant is not above his master. If they've done this to me, guess what? They're going to do it to you and use that servant-master relationship. That's what we are. And if we could just convince our friends in religious error, listen, you need to give up what you want to do. You need to give up the creeds of men. You need to give up the doctrines of men and do what God has said. Jesus even said, in vain they do worship me, teaching for doctrine the commandments of men. Commandments of men won't cut it. Because he's Lord God Almighty. And we need to understand that. One verse, if you can stick in your head. Luke 6, 46. And why call you me curios, curios? Lord, Lord. Why do you call me Lord? Why do you say you're subservient to my will? Why do you bow before me in the slave-master relationship? Why do you call me Lord and come before my throne and do what? Not the things which I say. If we could just somehow harness that and come to the realization, listen, God's Lord. When he says do something, I need to do it. Then that would just absolutely take problems out that we run across when, we, we, when Peter says repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins. Guess what? I'm going to repent and be baptized. Why? Because God said it. He said it through the inspired apostle Peter who was preaching the first gospel sermon there. I don't need any more evidence. I'm good with that. God said to do it. I'm going to do it. And I'm going to do it for the reasons that God said. But so many today don't want to do that. Well, God gives us both of his commands. Uh, he gives commands to sinners and he gives commands to saints. Now you see some folks, folks that have never obeyed the gospel who are not in a covenant relationship with God. In other words, they've never obeyed the gospel of Jesus Christ. They're not in the body of Christ. Then they're a sinner. And then there's those of us who have obeyed the gospel, who've been washed in the blood of the Lamb, who are saints. God has two different commands, if you will, different commands for each of us. First of all, to sinners, basically, you need to hear and do. You need to believe. And you need to listen to what I've said. In Romans 10, 17, we're told, So then faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. When a man opens up the scriptures, reads from the Bible, and tells you what God has said, when you see it in the Bible, you know that that's coming from God, hearing by the word of God. That's how faith is developed. That's how we come to understand that there is a God, that we need to do what God has said. Faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. Notice Matthew 7, 24. Jesus says, Therefore, whosoever heareth these sayings of mine and doeth them, there's the kicker, and doeth them, I will liken him unto a wise man who which built his house upon a rock. He says, And the rains descended and the floods came and the winds blew and beat upon that house and it fell not for it was founded upon a rock. Of course, he, right after that, he talks of the antithesis of that. He talks about the foolish man who heard his words and didn't do them. Built his house on the sand, the wind came, and what happened? Great was the collapse of it. It's one thing to hear. It's another thing to hear and to do. But not only are we to hear and do as a sinner, but to believe. Well, this is just the plan of salvation. You have to believe. You have to come to a faith that indeed Jesus is the Christ. Notice in John 8, 24, 
Jesus said, I said therefore unto you that ye shall die in your sins. For if you believe not that I am he, you will die in your sins. You have to believe that Jesus is the Christ. John 6, 28. The Jews asked him, they said unto him, what shall we do that we might work the works of God? See, right here is where a lot of us, where a lot of our denominational friends would leave us. And they would say, you folks teaching that baptism for mission of sins, you're doing nothing more than trying to work your way to heaven. And that's where I just say, well, what about John chapter 6, verses 28 and 29? Because you say, I have to believe. You say, I have to believe. You say, I have to have faith. And then once I have faith, I'm saved. Notice what Jesus says about faith. They want to, know, want to know what they must do to work the works of God. Notice what Jesus said. This is the work of God, that ye believe on him who he hath sent. So you see those of us who have been told all our lives, you know, that we're trying to work our way of heaven to heaven because we're telling folks that they need to be baptized, you can turn that right back around on our denominational friends and say faith only and say, well, you're trying to do the same thing. Jesus right there says, the Bible, so the Bible says, Beliefs of work, there you are believing. What are you, bringing God into your debt to save you because you're believing? And, of course, they wouldn't say that. I, I doubt very few of them ever even thought about that. Well, not only are we to believe, but we need to repent. Started off with John the Baptist. His first sermons was repent, for the kingdom of God is at hand. Jesus as well, John 14, uh, 4, 17. From that time, Jesus began to preach, saying, repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Luke 13, 3, talking to the uh, folks there, he says, I tell you, nay, except you repent, you shall all likewise perish. Paul, same message, Acts 17, 30, at times of this ignorance, God winked at, but commands what? All men everywhere now to repent. What does repentance mean? Simply changing your mind. From living like the world, living to the world's standards, to living to God's standards. Change of heart, change of mind. Not only that, but confession. Notice Romans 10 at verse 17, that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth an audible confession that indeed you believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God, and that God hath raised him from the dead. Matthew 10, 32 and 33, we quote a lot of times. Jesus said, if a man will confess me before the Father, I'll con excuse me, a man confess me before uh, men, him will I confess before my Father. So an audible confession. Here I think it's probably talking more about the life uh, that we live. But in, uh, obviously in Romans 10, it's talking about an oral confession. Notice baptism. Once again, that's just something that most folks will leave off. You pick up the track in the bathroom, most of the time you're going to see they don't say anything about baptism. Most of the time. Uh, most folks today do not preach that baptism is for remission of sins. Do not preach or teach that one must be baptized uh, to be saved. But that's what the Bible says. A lot of folks will take issue with that. I realize that. But I'm going to go with Mark 16, 16. Jesus says, he that believes and is baptized shall be saved. That's pretty simplistic. In Matthew chapter 28, verses 19 and 20, go therefore teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. But not only are we to hear and believe, repent, confess, be baptized, but, you know, we sing that song. More of self and, uh, you know, less of thee, all of self. And, you know, it's kind of a progression there. One of the things we have to learn that when we're a sinner and when we want to approach God, when we want to obey the gospel, is that we're going to have to put God first. So passages like Matthew 6, Seek ye first the kingdom of God. And all these other things, what he's talking about there is mammon shall be added unto you. I've got to put God first and foremost in my life. I need to do the Father's will. I remember as a young man coming out of denominational error, this was a tough passage for me. Not every one, Jesus says in verse 21 of Matthew 7. Now remember, this is Sermon on the Mount. You don't get any more base principle than this. Jesus sits, uh, sits down, starts to teach on the Mount, and we think of all those things, the, you know, the, the Beatitudes and let your light so shine, and you've heard said of the old time, but now I say unto you. And now in, in chapter 7, he says, Not every one that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven. Now, see, that really got me. That really stopped me in my tracks when I was 14, 15, 16 years old because I'd been taught my whole life that whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. If you believe that Jesus is Lord and, you know, <laughs> if, you, if you claim Lord, Lord, if you call him, ask him into your heart, you're saved. And once that's the case, there's nothing that can happen to you. And I would read this passage in Jesus, Jesus himself, Jesus Christ says, not everybody that calls me Lord, Lord, 
Well, that went right against the grain of everything I'd ever been taught. Shall enter into the kingdom of heaven? Jesus, what are you talking about? Why, well, whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Have you read that in Romans? Uh, how does that work? But he that doeth the will of my Father which is in heaven. Notice what he goes on to say. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name? These were folks who were working for Jesus now. These were people who were working for the Lord, and in thy name have cast out devils, and in thy name done many wonderful works. And then I will profess unto them, I never knew you depart from me, ye that work in equity. I'm going to tell you, that stopped me in my tracks as a young man. Not a member of the Lord's church, but a, one, a person who wanted to go to heaven, who wanted to do what God said. And then it made sense to me that Jesus was saying, you've got to do what the Father says. In vain they do worship me, teaching for doctrine the commandments of men. You can't do what men have said. You have to do, back up in verse 21, not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven, but he that doeth the will of my Father, which is in heaven. You see, that's the key. And now, as a much older man, I read that, that section, and it still troubles me. Because I realize that not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, Brethren, what do you think the parable of the wheat and the tares is all about? They, those angels, they reap what? The kingdom. The wheat and the tares is talking about people in the kingdom, in the church, if you will, in the body, who are not what they ought to be. Imagine that. Somebody in the church that ain't what they ought to be. You know, that's always been funny to me. People say, well, I ain't going down that church down there. There's a bunch of hypocrites. Well, I tell you what, you find one that doesn't have some folks in it, you know. I mean, give me a break. That's the whole thing with a group of people. Every church has folks that are what they ought to be and ought not what they ought to be because there's people in it. Some of us may be in that situation right now. I know in my life in times past, I've been in a situation where I wasn't doing nothing but holding down the pew and not doing that regularly. And so when I read this and see that not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven, at one time I thought, hey, this is talking to me because I'm in denominational error. Well, I still think it's talking to me because I'm in the church and I realize that just because I've been baptized into the kingdom doesn't mean I'm guaranteed anything. I've got to walk the walk. I've got to do the will of the Father. What if today I stop doing the will of the Father? Guess what? I would be lost. I would be an erring child of God. And there's many people listening to this right now, maybe watching it on television, who will say, well, that fellow doesn't have a clue. Doesn't he know that once you're saved, you're always saved? That's not what this is talked about. These are warnings, and we'll, we'll talk about this even more tonight, but the warnings in the Bible are legion, warning us to be faithful. For instance, tonight we'll talk about uh, Peter saying, uh, be sober because you're adversary of the devil. Well, why do you need to be sober for? You know, and sober there doesn't mean drunk, not drunk. It means on watch. You know, watch, why do you need to do that if you can't be lost? And so, Matthew 7, 21 through 23 is a warning, brethren and friends. Not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven, but he that doeth the will of my Father which is in heaven. We need to be doing the will of God, no doubt. Well, we also, as a sinner, learn that we're going to have to forsake all. That's pretty hard, especially as a young person. Forsake all? Luke 14, 33, so likewise, whosoever he be of you that forsaketh not all that he hath, he cannot be my disciple. Well, what all does that mean? Well, I think Matthew 10, 37 even takes it to, to another level. He that loveth father and mother more than me is not worthy of me. Now, wait a minute. My mama? I've got to love God more than my mama? I've got to love God more than my son or daughter or more than, uh, you know, doesn't he that loveth son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me? That's kind of hard to swallow early on. And, and, you know, especially when you're a young person, you have a tendency to be kind of jealous anyway. I remember I was dating a little old girl one time. And I thought, I got to love her. I got to love God more than I love Stephanie. How can I do that? But then I figured it out. You see, God wants me to put him first. And that's going to be make me a better, at the time, boyfriend. Make me a better fiance, they say. Make me a better husband. Make me a better father. Make me a better worker. Everything is just as it ought to be if God is first and foremost in my life. My wife wouldn't be able to find a better husband than a Christian. And see how that works together? We put God first and everything is going to flow just as it should. And we're going to be the best possible father, 
a brother, sister that we can possibly be. But that's hard initially to learn. I've got to put God first. I've got to put God before my friends. I've got to put God before my activities and those things that I count so fun. Well, let's jump on the other side now. Commands to a saint. Let's talk about us now, brethren. Commands to saints. Commands to the holy. Command to the people of God. We've got to do some things. First of all, present our bodies as a living sacrifice. That means I don't do bad things to it. I don't do things that will kill it. Romans 12, 1, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, you present your bodies a living sacrifice. Just like in the old days, remember they'd take a lamb or a bullock or something, offer it up as a sacrifice. Paul says, we offer up our bodies as a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. Be not conformed to this world, you know, the schematic, don't lay out your life as it would have you to be, but be transformed, metamorpho, change into something by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God, constantly, constantly changing, trying to look more like Christ and less like the world. That's our reasonable service. Not only to present our bodies, but love not the world. Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the, world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of flesh, lust of eyes, pride of life, those three things that God Eve, those three things that the devil tried with Jesus, Matthew chapter 4, they're the same things he's going to try with me and you today. Lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, pride of life, that's not of the Father, but is of the world. And the world passeth away and the lust thereof, but he that doeth the will of God abideth forever. And brethren, that's not talking about not being able to go out and watch the sun come up and say, man, that's beautiful. Man, I love that. Oh, can't do that. That's loving the world. No. Talking about worldliness, worldly things, mammon, you know, things that will separate us from God. Heavens declare the glory of God and the firmament that showeth his handiwork, Psalms 19. Those spectacular things that we get to enjoy so often that God has placed there for us. Of course, we can love those things, appreciate those things. But this is talking about stuff that would separate us from God. Love not the world. Love, and I mean, man, that is the badge, you will, if you will, of discipleship. Hereby, you know, they'll know you to my disciples if you have love one to another. In 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 9, Paul says, But as touching brother love, you have need that you have not need that I write unto you, for you yourselves are taught of God to love one another. That is the badge of discipleship. And brethren, we have to have that kind of love for one another. And it's not an easy thing to develop. It takes time. And it, it's easier with some brethren now to have that warm, fuzzy feeling, but that's not what he's talking about here. This kind of love is a sacrificial love. This kind of love is a, is a love that will put others' desires in front of your own, just like in a marriage relationship. You know, there won't be problems at the local congregation if everybody's not seeking his own, if they're trying to do what others would, have, would like to do. Uh, that's, that's one of the, you know, badges of, of discipleship, if you will. Devenge not yourselves. That's something that, uh, you know, that song, you know, <laughs> You begin out more of self and less of thee, and at the end it's all of, you know, uh, all of thee and none of self. We need to learn to be selfless, and that's, that's a, something you have to teach yourself. It's not a natural thing. Just like avenging not yourself. Somebody runs up and slaps you in the head, most of the time you want to run them down and slap them back. I mean, that's how it works. But that's not how God would have us to be. Dearly beloved, avenge not yourselves, but rather give place unto wrath. For it is written, vengeance is mine, I will repay, saith the Lord. Therefore, if thine enemy hunger, feed him. If he thirst, give him drink. For in so doing, thou shalt heap coals of fire on his head. Be not overcome of evil, but overcome evil with good. That doesn't make a lot of sense to us. Human nature, we like to think that, you know, we can pay back. You know, you suppress, you know, carnal weapons, things, just now, things of that nature, power, might, strength. Folks, overcoming evil with good has been going on for a couple of thousand years, and it's the most po po powerful force on this earth. You think about the shape that the world was in prior to Christianity and look at the shape afterwards. And what kills me, though, is to look at how Christianity, in my mind, is losing a foothold just in the world. And we see these world religions that are be being stronger or getting stronger, and it's just amazing to me that uh, Christianity is being pushed out in and, and so many places, and I'm like, what are, you, what are you going to replace it with? You know, we've taken God out of the schools. We've taken God out of the American society, if you will, and, and we're having real problems dealing with uh, Sandy Hook and things of this nature. And I don't mean to make little of that, and, and I don't. 
But I'm going to tell you something. When you grow up in a nation that's been responsible for over 50 million murders of young babies, uh, you know, and 22 come up, and then you start to, what, what I guess what frustrates me is when you have people who don't believe in God, they don't use God at all in their lives, they can care little or nothing about God, and then all of a sudden something comes up and they say, well, that's bad, that's evil. Well, what are you basing that on? You know, what's your standard for good or what's your standard for evil? Uh, without God, there is no evil. Uh, there is no, you know, right or wrong. There's just whatever we want. Uh, one of the, uh, one of our older preachers years ago was debating a fella, and of course, you know, we've talked many times about the flu and Warren debate where, you know, Brother Warren made, basically, Anthony Flew had to take the position that Hitler did something wrong when he killed six and a half million people. But Brother Bales was debating a fellow one time and just told him, just straight up, says, you know, if what you say is right, and there's no such thing as right or wrong, there is no such thing as objective evil, if something is right in and of itself or something is good in and of itself, he says, there's no reason that we just shouldn't take you out here right now and lynch you. He said, give me one good reason why we shouldn't do that. And a person that doesn't believe in the God of the Bible can't do that. If they believe in, you know, the idea of evolution and that we're just nothing but happy-go-lucky bugs that made the, you know, got lucky dirt, if you will, then an exterminator is nothing more than someone who goes out, you know, uh, that is no worse than somebody who kills a bunch of children, if you will. And that's why we, we've got to look at this and what we're doing to our country and try to encourage young people to realize what they are. They're beautifully and wonderfully made. They're created in the image of God. You're not some kind of beast. You're not just an animal. You're a human being created in the image of God. And years ago, we didn't have to tell kids that. They were taught at home. They were taught in other places. I'll never forget it. You know, something I hadn't thought about until I heard Wesley Simon say it once. He says, you want to talk about guns in the schools? And now Wesley, he's still alive. Now, we're not talking about somebody that's hundreds of years old. He said, we used to drive to school with them in the back window. Everybody took their guns to school. You think it's a gun problem? You think that's what's wrong with this country? We got a gun problem? Folks, what we've got is a God problem. People, young people, pocket knives, guns, they had them. They didn't run around shooting each other with them. They realized, hey, man, that's a human being. They're created in the image of God. I'm a human being. I'll stand accountable for that. But when you teach them from this high, they're nothing more than a bug. What do you expect? And you can put all this legislation that you want out there. You, you can legislate everything to, to death. It's not going to fix it. This is, a, this is a moral problem. And we need to see it as such. Be not overcome of evil, but overcome evil with good. We need to help our country see that. Be steadfast. That's the, brethren, I'm going to tell you, that's a hard thing to do. Therefore, my beloved brethren, be steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, for as much as you know that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. I know that you're hearing that it's time to change. I know that you're hearing Pierce Morgan saying it's time to edit the Bible. I know you're hearing those things. You know, the Bible's an old book. Things have changed. We, we need to change. As a society, we need to change. That's, that's not what this passage is saying. It's be, you be steadfast. You don't move. You're not tossed around. Uh, like some child or some, uh, you know, something blowed with the wind. Be steadfast. And we can be steadfast on the scriptures. And that as Christians is our responsibility. And we're going to have to teach our neighbors. We're the pillar and the ground of truth. If we're not going to do it, it's not going to be done, brethren. That's why we need to be loud. And we need to let people hear the truth. Homosexual marriage is wrong. And they can outlaw it. They can make it a hate crime. They can do whatever they want to do. It was wrong in Sodom and Gomorrah. It was wrong in Leviticus 18 under the time of Israel. It's wrong today. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 9, Romans chapter 1. These passages are real clear. As a matter of fact, the New King James, the new translations in 1 Corinthians 6, 9, take out the old word in feminine and just stick in there homosexual because it's a sin. It's an abomination before God. And I realize that there are powers and wheels moving right now that are trying to say that what I just said should be illegal. And that's not, that's not I'm not making that up. It, has, it isn't the case yet. But how long will it be before a man can't read Leviticus 18.8? 8? 
Or a man can't read 1 Corinthians 6, 9. You know, I thought it was pretty interesting as the leader of our nation was standing in Congress the other day. Did you see the words up above his head? Because the only reason I saw it is because you kept seeing the picture, you know. What did it say? In God we trust. Let's try it again. In God we trust. That is in the halls of Congress. The President of the United States is standing in front of it. And brethren, that's not talking about... <laughs> Brethren, that is not talking about the, Jew, the God of the Jews. Uh, that's not talking about the God of Muhammad. Go back and look at the fellows that signed the Constitution. Did any of them have on yarmulkes? Did you see any uh, turbans? Who signed that? What were those things based upon? And yet we're being told today, you know, we need to be... Uh, what does that coexist? We need to be uh, allow other religions to do their. Nobody said they're, they can't practice their religion. Nobody said we shouldn't be tolerant of other folks to, to practice their religion. Nobody in this country has ever said we ought to outlaw that. But at the same time, we're to be so tolerant and everything. Let's go to Saudi Arabia and build a church. You see how long that stands. You see, when you get arrested at the gate for trying to bring in a Bible, you can't even get that in. Be steadfast. Brethren, that's me and you. That's the commandment we have. Lay by in store. There's another commandment. Brethren, we don't like to talk about it, but it's in the Bible. Did you know that? First Corinthians chapter 16, now concerning the collection, that's taking up of money. For the saints, as I have given order to the church of Galatia, even so do ye. Upon the first day of the week, let everyone lay by in store as God hath prospered him. You know, I've talked about this a lot of times, but I finally found a picture. Here's one of my brethren being baptized. you believe that? Notice all of him got under the water but his wallet. <laughs> well, we like to make fun of that, and that, that's kind of a funny thing. But that's, we know that's not right. You know, I give God my time. I give God my money as well. There's uh, to lay by stores I've been prospered. If we don't have anything, then God doesn't expect anything. But if he prospers, he expects us to give back as well. Restore such a one. That's a command to a saint now. Sinners can't go around restoring people to the New Testament church. Saints can Saints are supposed to, brethren, if any man be overtaken in a fault, you which are spiritual, restore such a one the spirit of meekness, considering thyself, lest thou also be tempted. Not only that, but not to keep company. Do you realize as a Christian I have responsibility not to run around with those folks who are going to cause me to not be what I ought to be? Notice 1 Corinthians 5, verse 11. Now I've written you, do not keep company. If any, any man that is called a brother, that's talking about an errant brother, is called a fornicator or covetous or an idolater. 2 Thessalonians 3, 6, again, talking about brethren. We commend you, brethren, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. You withdraw yourselves from every brother. Of course, both these passages are talking about brethren, but 1 Corinthians 15, 33, evil communications corrupts good morals. That's talking about running around, the wrong, running around with the wrong crowd. And surely as a Christian, I realize I shouldn't do that. Not only that, but I am to go and to preach. Do you realize that's just not for the preacher? Yeah, it doesn't say, and as he looked out over the preachers, he said, go. No, he said, to each and every one of us. It's the great commission to go and to preach and to all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. But I tell you one way we can do that, not only can we talk to our neighbor, not only can we talk to those people that we live now, those that we live with, but uh, when we help other folks, as we do here, Roger Campbell and uh, Daniel Gaines and others that we, we're, we're helping to go into all the world and preach the gospel. We're going to be in Malaysia. We're going to have an impact in, in, uh, uh, in Africa. That's just a great thing, brethren. That is a great thing. But <clears throat> not only that, if you love me, I think the hardest thing sometimes, brethren, and I've seen many brethren that didn't do this. Jesus said, if you love me, what have I got to do? I've got to be faithful unto death. I've got to be faithful. And this isn't uh, unto the word ice that we're used to, a lot of preposition. This is an arcane. That means up until, up till, or the beginning of. In the beginning was the word, same word there, the beginning. The beginning of death. Till I die, I need to be faithful. What about you this morning? Are you a member of the New Testament church? If not, you need to obey the gospel. We've already talked about what to do. Perhaps in times past, you've left your first love. You're an erring child of God. Then why not come back home? Just as Simon the sorcerer was told in Acts chapter 8, Repent of this thy wickedness, and pray God that the thoughts and intents of thy heart may be forgiven thee. That's the second law of pardon, if you will. If we can encourage you and help you in any way, we encourage you to come as together we stand and sing.